But the notion of being in perpetual beta, it's a sort of a tech term, you know, it came from mastering software and the beta was like not quite finished, but that's kind of how we all are. It's just more of an acceptance, I think, of life and a way of living. And there are probably people who wouldn't use that phrase who've, you know, millennia before and other kind of spiritual traditions or whatever just accepted um, the beauty of imperfection, but being being out like, you know, they ship the software or with yourself online or with other people in your life, even if you don't go online at all, to be yourself outside of the enclosure of your skull or your subconscious. I would say all the things, all the hashtags or keywords that describe me aren't enough to be me. My first, uh, my first show, I look like an egg but identify as a cookie, sort of about that. It's about, I bake cookies in the show with the audience together and the ingredient, you know, you need everything and even more than all the ingredients to make what it is that you're gonna have at the end. So that's my sort of post-identity politics way of living in the world. I sort of want the differences and the togetherness and I don't want the um, expensive sort of hiding of self to have it. I don't think we can have that. I think just tolerance alone isn't, isn't really enough and I think that at this point business and technology and social justice and art are all trying to solve the same problem about how we can really be with each other and that means really seeing each other and I don't know that we know how to do that really well. I don't think it gets you very far. Also to just sort of say is it this or is it that? It sets up a quick little nice setup for the style of media that we have, but it won't get you any satisfying answer, or make anything different in the long run. And it certainly won't bring people together, which the net and then social media on top of the web has sort of accelerated the clear, obvious drive that we all have to connect with each other and that that's kind of what drives everything. Relationalness, how I'm connected to you, how do you feel, what's going on, I'm noticing how you're fake, all this kind of stuff has been sort of outsourced to women and children, for mostly women for a long time. And not because just, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are gonna argue that you know there's some kind of biological disposition, but we've, the part we can do something about, the part where we're socially kind of pushed in that direction, has been pretty heavy. I personally don't care about what's biolog biologically given because I, you can't do, I mean it's interesting to hear, but you can't do anything about it. So I'm certainly, I'm more interested in what can we do than how can I throw my hands up and say there's nothing that can be done? And I think it's exciting. Uh, to me, the web and social media in particular is translating what's been relational into data. So it's understood by people who are so, a lot of guys in particular, who are relationally challenged enough that they're learning relationalness 101. And you'll see lots of guys, their little hipster beards, thanking each other. So we call it like a virtual thank you notes, which is something supposedly only women did and we're supposed to send each other or greeting each other on their birthdays on Facebook. You'll see these sorts of social kind of checking in things that would have been seen as girly. Um, and I think part of that's because it's made so literalized. I think it's people's nature to be relational in the first place. So to have that kind of connectedness and move to intimacy, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I know it might not seem like everything's more intimate now because there's so much self-promotion. There's not any more than there was the last 80 years, it's just I think people coming to a new medium and trying to do that thing and achieving one version of success with it, but I still see, I still see transformation and I think in the same way that, you know, gay rights uh, happen in a period, a movement around them where sexuality is like just starting to be dealt with in the U.S. in a certain way and then what gay people represent sex only to people who are not gay or certainly in the law, that's what they represented for a long time, just sex because that's how they were different, right? And then they would kind of push the idea of sexuality generally and the reason the degree to which gay people are sort of marginalized to me always correlated to the degree to which sexuality was generally an uncomfortable thing for anyone. And this campus I was just on where I, I, don't, I hope you can still hear me over the water, 20, 20 helped all these kids come out. I don't think things were so peachy keen for all the straight kids either sexually. It was really clear there was a relationship between how drunk did everyone have to be to get together at the frat parties who were straight and how hard was it for the queer kids to even know that they were gay and come out and find each other as a sort of, we can't really acknowledge what we're doing, we're gonna do this thing, we're gonna try to not be doing it while we're doing it. And then we won't talk about it. And then we, we're gonna have a hard time making it be ongoing. And that seemed to me to be true regardless of orientation. It was just true. And then because of some orientation was more in the margin, it was a little tougher for them. And I, my hunch is, it's just an early intuition, it's the first time I really thought this, you're asking me, I would think that there's this kind of correlation around trans stuff too, that is, we're gonna have this kind of gender shift and notions of 
fluidity of not of straight folk. I mean, you know, things we considered supposedly male. I mean, you know, second wave feminism was tons about trying to not have these static roles, but the reality of that, we have already a lot of the reality of it. It's just kind of hidden. It's just kind of hidden. Guys tweeting about their kids, like, right, like that would have happened pre-second wave. There's been a lot of success, just like everyone has email, so no one thinks it's revolutionary anymore, because guess what? The internet already changed your life. It's just so humdrum to you that you don't experience it anymore. You get that feeling of the shit's going to come down before you re it becomes just you know everybody using it, which is why if you're someone like me or maybe you lived in a life where it happens maybe 10, 15 years earlier for you, it gets called the future. 